So I'm going to be talking about um, our Permian Methane Analysis Project, Permian Map, um, using multiple approaches to, to measure methane emissions from oil and gas facilities, and then releasing the data online as quickly as possible. So this video, this image here is a, a drone shot of the University of Wyoming's uh, mobile research laboratory um, doing some OTM 33A measurements in Texas. And so I'll go through this stuff really quickly since it, your group doesn't need it, but methane is very important. And methane and CO2 are important. And as we know, oil and gas is one of the major sources and often lots of cost-effective options for reducing emissions. Um, and EDF has a lot of principles we follow on our science, but particularly working with, with academics, a lot of times having academics be the PIs, using multiple methods, particularly so we can, we can validate approaches, um, seeking input from independent scientific experts. So we have, uh, for example, scientific advisory panel um, on, on this project, including Adam Brandt, uh, transparency, so making sure the data is, is public, um, and then publishing paper, publishing results in peer-reviewed journals. And as I'll talk about a little bit, it, this project is slightly different because uh, it's emphasizing public data release rather than peer-reviewed journals. Um, yeah, the inventory, uh, uh, we have Melissa on the call, so we know all about the inventory, and just the, some of the empirical data showing it, it tends to underestimate emissions particularly on the, the production side, um, while, while the mid and downstream are, are getting pretty close. Um, and that's likely due to kind of super emitters or, or emission sources that are very difficult to quantify with, with bottom-up approaches and often difficult even to assign them to a, a source category. Uh, so there's a lot of, of research questions in this project. But the three primary ones are, you know, what's the total methane emissions in the Permian, uh, particularly our study area, and then can we measure changes in emissions over time in 2020? Um, second is, is what's the performance of individual oil and gas companies? And particularly, can we come up with a, a statistically robust metric to compare operator performance? So things like gas production normalized emissions with uncertainty to say if one company is better than the other. Uh, and then finally, what's the contribution of flares to methane emissions? So uh, I'll be talking particularly about some qualitative assessments of flare performance on, on this project. Um, so yeah, so our approach, uh, as I mentioned with our principles, it's, it's quite similar to that, but <clears throat> the big difference is here is we're trying to get the data out as quickly as possible. And we're now, um, about at a week between for our aerial measurements between the measurement and getting it on our website. Um, and at the end, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about some of the, the challenges involved in that. As you can imagine, there are many, uh, lots of pressures about getting data out as quickly as possible, but at the same time, you know, making sure it is quality shared and final. Um, so the study area, uh, we're focused on the Delaware Basin, particularly this, this 10,000 square kilometer box uh, on the Texas-New Mexico border. Uh, it counts for over a third of the production, but only about 10% of the wells, so really the high, high production core. Um, about 11,000 wells in the box, over 100 companies. Um, but we're also gonna be doing some measurements in the Midland, and, and our flare survey is, is includes Delaware and Midland. Um, to mention uh, the Jonganoff study that came out in Science Advances recently. So um, using Tropomi data, estimated the emissions in the total Permian were 2.9 teragrams, uh, with the, the oil and gas emission loss rate being 3.7%, um, which I think was about two times that they got from the gridded EPA inventory. And as you can see, uh, this is their posterior inventory, uh, the really hot spot of emissions is where our study area is. No surprise, because we saw the study preliminary data, so one of our you know, goals was to really pick, pick this major emission spot. Um, so, yeah, so now I'm going to go through the different approaches we're using to measure or to address each of the questions. So first is uh, trends in total emissions in the area. Um, so using um, 
mass balance flights and uh, at tower based inversions. So the tower based inversions are being led by Ken Davis's group out of Penn State University. They have five towers around the region, um, four existing cell phone towers. One at the Carlsbad National Park uh, Air Quality Monitoring Station. They have 100 meters up uh, inlets uh, and then Picaros at the, the base and, and sheds at these, these facilities. So they're continuously measuring methane concentration. Uh, and then they're, they're using an atmospheric transport model uh, to, to, uh, to estimate kind of a, a posterior emission rate. Um, and they do this daily. Um, let's see, here we go. Yeah, so there's the Picaro. They're showing them setting it up. Um, and oh uh, yeah, so I'm showing the aircraft has a lot of the same instruments of the Picaro um, that they use when they do their mass balances. Um, but here's showing kind of an estimate, one of their examples of a daily estimate. And this is one actually where we have um, the aircraft do a, a flight around the study area. Um, and this, um, so I know Zach Barkley from Penn State, he said this is the most beautiful mass balance he's ever seen. Um, it is pretty nice, I'll admit. You got, so we had west, really great westerly winds, huge enhancement on the eastern transect and not much on the upwind. So um, really great low uncertainty measurement. Ended up being 135,000 tons. That's 3.5% of gas production. So we're doing these combination, these, these large flights about once a month, and then getting daily estimates of of emissions from Penn State. And the uncertainty level, it's about, about five to seven day average seems to be pretty good. That will account for, for any of the kind of day-to-day -day uncertainty in meteorology and can start seeing actual trends in emissions. Um, yeah, so th these are the slides I took out. So uh, we do have some initial trends data. Um, I'm, I have a, a paper. I'm, in preparation for a, a kind of high profile journal. I'm hoping to submit uh, next Friday. <laughs> I don't know if I'll make that or not, but very soon. Um, and let me, so I can't, I can't share the results, but well, uh, actually we, as we get to the end, I'll, I'll walk y'all through some stuff which may, you may be infer some results from it. Um, so now I'll move on to the next question, which is comparing operator performance. So this was a really strong advocacy question we get, which uh, as many of you know, there's tremendous interest in, in being able to, to kind of differentiate the emissions of different oil and gas streams. So you know, certifying natural gas is either like low methane gas or, or maybe some kind of like carbon tax, but there's a lot of interest in, in being able to do that. So we were going to see, can, can we do that in the Permian? So using two kinds of data, uh, we have site level measurements from University of Wyoming using uh, OTM 33A and then Dana Colton's um, kind of drive-by transect method. Uh, and then have aerial, we're calling cluster measurements, which are small mass balances, typically about a, a one to two kilometer radius circle. Um, and they can get about Usually it's somewhere like five to maybe a dozen wells um, in each of these clusters. But that's really about as tight of a circle as they can fly in their Mooney aircraft. Um, so um, talk about kind of how, how we're using that data scene. Um, yeah, so this is just OTM 33A. Y'all probably know the basic it's fitting kind of it's an inverse gassing approach um, as they drive downwind. So um, so we actually um, we hired University of Wyoming to do some measurements in 2018, and Anna Robertson has a paper that is uh, currently in final stage of review. Hopefully, it will be published very, very soon. Um, so, confidentially, we can see her results here, which are no surprise. The Permian emissions are are in the high end of, of other measured basins, so kind of in this Uinta DJ in, uh, range, so substantially higher than a lot of the other basins. Um, and yeah, it's showing you know, the, the value of getting these site level emissions. So um, they also have a they have an infrared camera, um, so they can look at kind of the source of emissions, and um, and they also have a, a PTR cost mass spec that continuously measures speciated VOCs, including benzene compounds. So they can um, so uh, so they have all they can eventually get kind of 
VOC OTM measurements, uh, and also, um, I mean, they, they drove around hundreds of miles with this continuous VOC monitor. So, uh, really interesting data set that may be useful for things like health assessments in the future. Um, so now to the aircraft data. So this is uh, scientific aviation's um, GAP, what they call it, Gauss's Law Mass Balance Approach. So, so basically how it works is they're doing this, this cylinder around the area, target area, and they, they measure from as low as they can to uh, basically where to either the boundary layer or wherever they can no longer see enhancement from the plume. So the idea is to get the full kind of cross section of, of a plume. Uh, here is an example of a beautiful plume, uh, not in the Permian, because they never look this nice. But if you have, you know, one point source, you can see, boom, there's a plume. You can do kind of compare up, integrated upwind and downwind concentrations and get the flux. Uh, in the Permian, they're a lot messier. So here, here's one, but there's a lot of sources. So, um, so you, it's often not a clear upwind, downwind, but, but they are using that to calculate emissions with uncertainty. Um, but seeing that due to the high density of sources in the region, it, it does make it challenging. And kind of detection limit wise, it's highly variable depending on kind of meteorological conditions and how close sources are. So occasionally they get down to about five kilograms per hour. Other times it seems more like it's over 100 to 500 kilograms per hour, depending on detection limit, just depending on kind of how, how their ability is to resolve upwind. Uh, they do have a FLIR camera that they're using from the Mooney. So uh, McKinsey basically sticks the camera out the window of the plane as they're going 200 miles per hour. And uh, doesn't work often, but when they see really big emissions like this unlit flare, they can get it. Um, I'll just admit, it's very hard to watch the videos as they're spiraling that fast. Um, causes me to have a headache, but it is a pretty neat way of, of identifying, quickly identifying large sources. Uh, so yeah, so we've, we've completed what we're calling survey one. So, so basically that was how this, yeah, oh shit. Oh, there we go. So how this works is that uh, we, let me go to the next slide, this will make more sense. So, so what we're doing is, so here's the study area. And what we're calling a survey is basically kind of a systematic survey of the entire 100 by 100 box in a way that's representative. Um, survey one was a combination of kind of randomly selected areas and then these site clusters. So we, we looked at what, um, most recent data on well ownership and then created these clusters of single operator sites. Um, so um, scientific Aviation completed that uh, a little over a month ago, uh, and then now we've moved on to a second survey, re-going over the area, but this time focusing a lot more on single operator clusters. And we'll be doing mo a lot of repeat clusters, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of ownership changes in the Permian, so um, these often change quite a bit, so it's a pretty dynamic process. Um, but overall, it works pretty well. Um, and they're, they're able to measure about, uh, use about five of these measured areas in a flight day. Uh, so we're developing operator metrics. They're probably going to be uh, loss rates like gas production normalized emissions. Uh, one really big challenge is, is the uncertainty. So how to calculate an uncertainty and what exactly that uncertainty means. You know, what is our data representative of? Is it the study area? Is it the full Permian? Being clear on that. And, and then as Many of y'all know, non-scientists never, you know, they completely ignore uncertainty. So that could be really risky if we put some, you know, Exxon better than BP or whatever, and, and then, you know, or, or Exxon, you know, they're not significantly different and the people are gonna ignore that. So we wanna be very careful that, that people only focus on significant differences and not, not just large differences that are due to the small sample sizes we have. Um, so yeah, so now I'm going to flare performance survey. Um, so we hired Leap Surveys Incorporated, a uh, helicopter-based OGI team to, um, to look at 300 flare locations in both the Delaware and Midland. Uh, and that we randomly selected these flares from the VIRS um, heat detect. So we used kind of radiant heat detections and then got all these flares and had them bit them in uh, 
February, March, and June. Um, and they'll be going out a fourth time later this fall. And, and we're told to basically go to the site um, and then assess the flare's performance. So was it lit? Was it and operating normally? Was it lit, but they saw problems like smoke or hydrocarbon slipping? Um, or was it unlit and venting or inactive? So now I'll show an example of an unlit and venting flare at a processing plant. Yeah, there we go. So very, very large and yeah, and it's right next to a lit flare. Um, so I showed this as both an example of a humongous emission source and we did tell the team to, you know, immediately let people know if they saw, if they thought anything was an imminent hazard. So this was the only time they detected an imminent hazard because, you know, if that, if that plume is over 5% methane hitting that lit flare, that could be a disaster. So, um, so they did land the helicopter and they, they, they told the facility manager, um, unfortunately they got yelled at. The guy wasn't very appreciative of, of them preventing an explosion, um, but the next day they, they did, it was fixed. Um, so um, it just shows that, yeah, these are not only huge methane sources, that, but they're potentially a catastrophic danger. Did they just fly through the plume? They may have, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would have landed sooner than that. <laughs> it looks pretty scary to me, but yes. Um, but yeah, they said they landed a safe distance and then just flagged, flagged them down. But um, I'll, I'll notice the site, the same site, Earthworks has a lot of IR videos from several months, uh, including the same flare. So even though they fixed it the next day, it seems like it's a recurring problem. Uh, so. Hopefully they'll, they'll have more permanent solutions. Um, so yeah, so the results. So uh, we had amazingly consistent results, all three surveys. So um, about 11% of the flares were malfunctioning um, each survey and it was about four to 6% ran were unlit and venting. Um, and so I did some really rough estimates of, of flare combustion efficiency. So basically if I assume you know, the 5% are, have 0% combustion efficiency, the 6% that are smoking or hydrocarbon slip are 90%, and the rest are the EPA default 98%, then you get 93% overall. Um, so with that level of methane coming through, you know, there's huge flare gas volumes in the Permian, so I estimate that, that it would account for about 10% of the uh, total methane as, as measured in the troponin study. The major, probably the largest source of methane. Uh, yeah, so we have a website, Permian Map. People have questions, I can walk y'all through it, but particularly it, it kind of shows, uh, and I guess the key here is, is it's showing measured areas. So each of these, these shapes is, is the actual spatial domain of the aerial measurement. Um, and then color coding is showing the, the absolute flux. If you there's another layer of wells and their owners, or at least who the owners were a couple months ago, the most recent data. And we, we attribute emissions to operators. So they're either like a, if there's multiple operators in there, we say it could be them. If there's a single operator, we say it's probably them. Um, but it's, it's very careful. We never say you know, like this emission is definitely this company because there's a bunch of things like gathering pipelines in these areas we don't know about. So, Theoretically, it could be somebody else. Um, you can also get flaring. You can get all the flaring videos on, or at least I think you can get all the malfunctioning flare videos on the website. If folks want to see the other ones, let me know. Um, and there should be a data download function. We're, we're waiting on some security features to be finalized, but any day now you should be able to click on, there's a download button here and you can get, get a lot of the like the flight raw data. Um, I think we'll have, yeah, mission rates, CSVs of, of concentrations. So yeah, so it should be really useful. Um, briefly, a couple other groups we're working on, working with, so the Tropomi team, or lots of groups, a couple groups using Tropomi data. Um, so looking at trends and emissions. Um, Avarice NG, 
um, and GAO, so with JPL and University of Arizona, they're doing flights in the region, so trying to coordinate with them. And then finally, uh, methane air, so the methane sat instrument on a fixed wing aircraft doing some, some tests on, on, on that. Um, so yeah, summaries, yeah, the multiple approaches are, are really great for, for detecting, rapid detection of emissions. Uh, operator performance, uh, this was for our funder, so it was a little more optimistic. So I'll, I'll give you the, the, you know, the realistic answer is it's really hard. So um, just due to the, the skewed nature of the emission rates, uh, to do something like this, I think to really constrain the uncertainty, you're gonna have to have lots of measurements and and I think you probably have to use an approach like like Avarice NG that can like a remote sensing approach that can get a lot more, you know, we can get hundreds, hundreds of measurements a day in order to do this efficiently. Um, but but at least you know this this will allow us to test test the approach and, and maybe do some estimates later of you know, how many measurements would you need a day in order to do this well. Um, yeah, flares are a big deal, the performance is atrocious. Um, and so definitely is a big source of, of mitigation and that um, and the data has been pretty valuable for companies so both we have had companies respond so some of them have uh, got usefulness from this, this data but again i'll be honest to say like even the week lag time is not good enough so and and a lot of times i don't even know if a day lag time is good enough so my, my theory is a lot of these emission sources may be asking minutes to hours um, and they're, they're, they're things like over pressurization problems um, and they come and go and, and the operators don't even know about them so um, it's, it's critical to, to at least get it soon enough that they can look at other data sources and maybe see if, if they would even be able to detect it which I think a lot of times they're not. Um, so yeah so that's the basic summary um, I guess I can give a little a little thing about the trends data. I don't think I have the flaring data here, but if, if y'all have seen the kind of Veer's estimates of flared gas volumes, there's been a really large decrease during the COVID oil price crash, um, over four four times decrease. Uh, it appears to be temporary, um, so uh, and is already starting to go back up. Um, so. And we've had, and we saw no change in in the performance of flared gas volume. So you could you could predict that the there would be a large change in the you know the residual methane from from those flares. And there also was a lot less completions during this time period. Uh, so uh, may, may be a big impact on those intermittent kind of emissions. So uh, that's kind of all I can reveal about those results. But it's it's pretty clear, you know, from activity data. Um, that that you would expect some large changes, um, but but the big thing is is you know these changes appear to be temporary and really only occurred when the oil prices were you know like twenty dollars a barrel or less. So so I, I think what kind of there's indications um, that really the Permian Basin is is over capacity and a, a lot of these issues are due to there's just too much gas, there's too much pressure, and there's all sorts of, of problems and. And really the, the best thing companies could do is just slow down the development of wells, even slightly, so to, to get under get under this capacity threshold. And that'd probably be a very cheap way of, of reducing emissions. Um, so I'll stop there and happy to take any questions.